The Troubles in Northern Ireland were a period from the late 1960s that ended in 1998 with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, a nearly 40-year period of constant warfare between the Catholic Provisional Irish Republican Army as well as the left-wing Irish National Liberation Army against the Protestant Ulster Volunteer Force, Ulster Defence Association, and British Security Forces. The Second Sudanese Civil War was a conflict that lasted from 1983 to 2005, ending with the creation of the world's youngest nation, South Sudan. These 22 years of war were fought between the Christian and animist Sudan People's Liberation Army and the Muslim Central Sudanese government. The Israeli-Palestinian Conflict A conflict that has been fought even before the creation of the State of Israel. A conflict that is still not resolved today. The almost century-long battle has mostly been fought between the Jewish-Israeli Defense Force, historically known as Irgun and Haganah, against the Muslim-Palestinian terrorist forces such as Hamas, Hezbollah, and various other independent rebels. So what do all these conflicts that are thousands of miles away from each other share in common? They all share being geopolitical disputes in which two different yet very similar people with different faiths share the same territory. These three conflicts are some of the most well-known geopolitical topics of the 20th century. But what if I told you there was a conflict and history similar to the troubles that happened in my very own province, a nation that is touching the American border? Pour des raisons humanitaires qui apparaissent évidentes par suite des développements des derniers jours et afin de sauver si possible la vie de l'attaché commercial de Grande-Bretagne, M. James Richard Cross, nous faisons lecture intégrale. October 1970, Montreal, Canada. This month, year and place probably seem insignificant to most people around the world, but to Quebecers, this time is a remembrance of a dark history. The FLQ, which stands for France de Libération du Québec, or Quebec Liberation Front in English, was a separatist, Marxist-Leninist terrorist group founded in Quebec in 1963 by George Shooters, Raymond Villeneuve, and Gabriel Houdon. Inspired by many other anti-imperial liberation groups, such as the National Liberation Front in Algeria and the Palestinian Liberation Organization in Israel, both groups which had also trained many of the FLQ members for their own Quebecois revolution. Between 1963 and 1970, the FLQ had detonated over 950 bombs, bombs targeted at English Quebecers, mostly hidden in mailboxes in the English communities of Montreal, such as Westmount. During this period, the FLQ had totaled over 160 violent incidents, as well as the deaths of eight people. This reached a boiling point in October 1970, a time that is now called the October Crisis. On October 5, 1970, two members of the FLQ had kidnapped British diplomat James Cross from his home. They had used him as leverage for the release of political prisoners and for the broadcast of their manifesto, which called for a revolution in Quebec to guarantee its independence on live television. Le Front de Libération du Québec n'est pas le Messie, ni un Robin des Bois des temps modernes. C'est un regroupement de travailleurs québécois qui sont décidés à tout mettre en œuvre pour que le peuple du Québec prenne définitivement en main son destin. Five days later, on October 10th, multiple members of the FLQ kidnapped Deputy Premier of the province of Quebec, Pierre Laporte, whilst he was playing football with his nephew on his own front lawn. Two days later, by request of the federal government, troops from the Royal 22nd Regiment were sent to guard federal property in Montreal. Then, on the 16th of October, the second time in Canadian history, the War Measures Act was enacted to deal with the situation. This meant more military intervention in the city of Montreal. On October 17th, the FLQ announced that they had killed the deputy premier and were shown that they should be taken seriously. After his death, they announced their demands to the government, such as the publication of the FLQ manifesto, the release of 23 political prisoners, as well as a safe passage of its members to either Cuba or Algeria. During the next month, police carried out several raids on known FLQ centers, arresting many of its main leaders, such as Bernard Lorty, for the kidnapping and murder of Pierre Laporte. Nearly a month later, on December 4th, British diplomat James Cross was released after negotiations by lawyers Bernard Mergler and Robert de Meyer. After the release of Cross, five known kidnappers of the FLQ were granted safe passes to Cuba with approval by Fidel Castro. 
Three members of the FLQ who were connected to the murder of Pierre Laporte were arrested on December 28th in the farming town of St. Luke. Shortly after, in January of 1971, the military withdrew from the city of Montreal. This marked the end of the October Crisis. The FLQ, a socialist terrorist group that targeted an ethnic minority in Quebec, a group that seemingly wanted to have a violent revolution to create a Marxist, Leninist, French-Canadian ethnostate, had seemingly disappeared from world history and nearly forgotten by the young Quebecois population. Why is this? Why was this specific geopolitical conflict totally forgotten? Although I cannot answer that fairly complex question, I'm going to try to answer how we got there and how it gave rise to many other separatist movements, as well as the forgotten history of English Quebecers like my father. Yeah, those are terrible times. Um, I remember seeing soldiers in trucks uh, passing by uh, elementary school, and they had rifles, and we, had, we didn't, my parents didn't let us really watch TV. We were only allowed one hour a day of TV. And so originally, I, I, I guess I knew less than most people, but eventually I, I did catch some things on the TV. And I, I came to the realization of what was happening. Um, it was no shock to me. Because I had felt that we were becoming an iron. So the, the FLQ would be the IRA. That, and, and it was a really terrible time. But the crazy thing is the outspoken people, that, the outspoken French people, even the so-called you know, so bourgeoisie of the French, were supporting it. I thought it was terrible to be supporting terrorism. The complexity of French-Canadian nationalism goes back over 250 years. From 1756 to 1763, a global conflict broke out between the large empires of Great Britain and France, both using smaller states as allies in the war. The war has become known to be the Seven Years' War. From as far north as Newfoundland and as far south as Louisiana, France colonized a territory that it named New France, and within the land lived many French colonists, mostly fur traders known as les habitants, or the inhabitants in English, as well as being known as les Canadiens and the modern territory of Quebec. After France's loss of the war, the territory of New France was under British control and the territory was split into the new British North American colonies, one of these new colonies being named Quebec. And for nearly 30 years, the province of Quebec operated within its own legal autonomy due to the colonial administration of James Murray and the Quebec Act of 1774, which allowed the French Quebecois population the right to exercise Catholicism and maintain French civil law. This was done to ensure that the conquered peoples of Quebec would not start a revolution because their lifestyle and laws were kept under British administration. In 1791, a constitutional act was enacted that split the prior province of Quebec into Lower Canada, which is present-day Quebec, and Upper Canada, which is present-day Ontario. The act mostly came into effect to allow loyalists of the 13 colonies to find a distinctly British home in the British North American colonies that had partly been French territories. It was also a step towards the assimilation of French Canadians with the strengthening of power of the Governor General in the region while also reducing the power of locally elected colonial assemblies. All the while, the average French Canadian served as a serf in an almost feudal system that had been transmitted since the days of New France, while the incoming British colonists created a bourgeoisie business class. The gap between the rich British business class and the poor servant French class was widening during the years that led to the Patriot Rebellions and Durham Report. After the War of 1812, French Canadian national sentiments were rising, mostly with the common factors of taking power away from the Catholic Church and the foreign British government and merchant class. It was known as the Patriot Movement. It was an almost left-wing populist movement that sought to fight for the working and starving French Canadians. The Patriot Movement officially created a party led by Louis-Joseph Papineau called the Parti Canadien, which later became the Parti Patriot. 
The party was determined to challenge the Anglophone majority in the Legislative Council, as well as fighting for Lower Canada's autonomy and control of civil services. Many of the desires of the Patriot movement were denied by the authoritarian Governor General Earl of Dalhousie. The conglomeration of the agricultural crises that had brought many French Canadians to the point of starvation, and the increasing immigration from the United Kingdom that made the Anglophone minority of Lower Canada into almost majorities in the urban business cities like Montreal and Quebec, created a revolution. The Patriot movement became increasingly radical, with many of its members not caring for political reform, but rather rebellion to further their goals. And between 1837 and 1838, a rebellion was started by French Canadians against the British authorities. To bring this back to the October Crisis, we can see many similarities between the Patriot movement and the subsequent French Canadian nationalism that led to the FLQ in the late 1960s. It is a history of classism that had perpetuated Quebec's history for a long time, that turned the Patriots into violent aggressors and turned the FLQ against the English of Montreal. The gap between rich and poor, between the English and French Canadians, turned regular French Canadians into left-wing nationalists fighting against the chains of colonialization and capitalism. But the main problem, although there may be similarities between the FLQ and Patriot political ideas and goals, they had entirely different contexts. To find this out, we'll have to look at the Quiet Revolution. Ton amour a changé ma vie Sans toi, tu The Quiet Revolution was a 10-year period from 1960 to 1970 in Quebec that marked major governmental, societal, and economic change. The years leading up to the Quiet Revolution had been known as the Dark Ages because of the authoritarian reign of Maurice Duplessis and the Union Nationale, a party that had infused traditionalism and economic liberalism, a party that had close ties to the Catholic Church. During his second term in office as Premier of Quebec from 1944 to 1959, most of Quebec's social programs such as health and education were under control of the church. The state was second to the church in political power, and under Duplessis, many of Quebec's mines and natural resources were exploited by foreign companies, most of whom were American. This meant that in the economic ladder, the average French Canadian was in the lower rung, whilst the average English Quebecer was doing quite well. But with his death in 1959, Quebec's government had gotten a new progressive leader, Jean Lesage. Jean Lesage's new liberal government was starkly anti clerical. He sought that the government of Quebec should take care of the province's social programs rather than the church. So under Lesage's premiership, the nationalization of many programs took place, especially the beginnings of Hydro-Quebec, the state-controlled hydroelectricity business. With the slogan, Maître chez nous, which means masters in our own home, Lesage sought to take economic control away from foreign companies as well as the English business class and into the hands of French Canadians. This was a huge turn in Quebec history. There was an evolution in the economic ladder. For basically the first time in Quebecois history, there was a true French business class. Now with empathy towards French Canadian history and sentiments due to hundreds of years of mistreatment by the church, the state, or the English business class, after Lesage, the Quiet Revolution took a turn for the worst. Instead of being truly about aiding the French Canadian working class with having an equal opportunity with the f English working class, to breed competition between both groups for the betterment of Quebec, the Quiet Revolution took a nationalistic turn similar to the old nationalism of Maurice Duplessis. As much as the Quebecois population seemingly resented him, their ideas and sentiments on autonomy and culture were very similar. In 1969, a year before the October Crisis, the First Language Act was passed, Bill 63, the act to promote the French language in Quebec. The bill was brought in by Jean-Jacques Bertrand and the Union Nationale, a very different version of the party since Duplessis. Bill 63 was a very good compromise between English and French Canadians. It allowed parents the choice to pick a school for their children 
given that the school gave adequate French courses. Bill 85 was also proposed by the Union Nationale, as many French Canadian nationalists did not think Bill 63 was sufficient at protecting the French language and culture, as many immigrants were choosing to pick English schools. Bill 85 would have forced immigrant children to get solely French education without choice from their parents. I think many Canadians and people from around the world can see how it's wrong that parents have no say in where their children can go for their own education. The state wanted to mandate where children went, but it was protested by many English Quebecers in the government and did not pass until a later variation in Quebec history. After Bertrand's premiership ended in 1970, after the October crisis, a new more nationalistic premier of the Liberal Party, Rabai Bourassa, was elected. It is somewhat strange to me that, after such a shocking event like the October crisis and the almost decades-long terror caused by the FLQ, in the same year, seeing how increased left-wing nationalist sentiments could lead to such pain, that the Quebecois population had just elected that. In 1974, the Second Language Act was passed, called the Official Language Act of 1974, also known as Bill 22. This was a far more extreme bill than Bertrand's Bill 63, and it was the reason Bourassa was elected to get things done for French Canadian nationalists. It made French the sole official language of Quebec, which many English Canadians called unconstitutional under Section 133 of the BNA Act, which was the Canadian constitution of the time. It made French the recognized language of government, business, and civil services. The bill also majorly affected education, especially allophone immigrants. The only kids allowed in English schools were those with significant knowledge of the language. Bill 22 was basically a mother tongue bill. You would expect the consequences of this to be more severe to immigrants rather than the average English Quebecer, but it even affected those in the English education system very severely, just like my father. So, what happened to your school once Bill 22 is implemented? Yeah, so I was going into grade 4 and I was going to Boharma Elementary School, which is a predominantly French area uh, where I live ne next to. And so there was 165 students, uh, of which uh, 100 kids were French. And uh, so when I went into grade 4, instead of being 165 students from the year before, it went down to 65. Because of that, the principal didn't speak any French uh, due to his seniority and that he was a teacher at one time, became the grade 5 and 6 teacher. And through seniority, the rest of the teachers were chosen. It was two teachers per grade, and I don't even think they ever received a, a, a kindergarten at that point. Um, so we were supposed to start French in grade four, and it, it, by grade six, it, it would almost be a basic conversational French should have been taught. And by the time I got to high school, I was so behind the other schools that uh, didn't lose their French teachers. Uh, so to me, this bill uh, really hurt uh, my learning French, but it. It also hurt the French from learning English. How did this change in education make you feel about the Barassa government? It made me realize that even though Barassa spoke English, he was French. And he was playing to the French majority as a politician. Originally, I guess I thought he was just doing it to. to but when I started to, to, be, to be a politician, he was doing it for votes, but when I, when I realized that what was in it, um, I realized that Quebec was basically becoming a, an, an Ireland. That two groups were uh, so opposing now and, and, and quite wrong. I don't know, I, I became uh, sort of fearful of what might happen. Would it have been better if Barassa would have left the prior educational bill? I think so. I really do. Um, I myself would probably be fully bilingual. Um, I really have to struggle with French, and I believe that later 
the later that you learn French, the harder it is. And the only way to get bilingualism is the earlier the age. And this, this bill, it, it stopped. It, it did the opposite of the what was originally told it, to us that this bill was to protect French and protect the French culture. It, it, it made them into a, I don't know, an isolated culture and uh, a resentful culture. The increasing anti-Canadian and anti-English language sentiment grew in the mid-70s. Three years after Bill 22, the most strict of any language bill was implemented, Bill 101. The Charter of the French Language was passed in 1977 under René Lévesque and his new political party, Parti Québécois, the first official Quebec separatist party in Canada. Bill 101 made, similarly to the prior Bill 22, French the official language of government and business, but it also attempted to make French the language of personal and daily life. This new bill made all public and private signage in French, making it illegal to have English words on a sign if it was above any French words or in larger print. The only true exception were multinational companies that did not need to change their foreign names into French. This bill also majorly impacted education. It heavily took inspiration from Bill 85 that was supposed to be implemented in the late 1960s. Bill 101 only allows those who have a parent that had an English elementary or high school education in Canada to attend English school. There are some other exemptions like children with serious learning disabilities or those who have temporary stay in Quebec for education or work, but the bill fundamentally was to force immigrants coming to Quebec to attend French schools. Even until today, there are still debates and opinions on the bills. Opinions by people like my immigrant mother, my English-Canadian father, or my mixed French-Canadian stepfather. Do you believe that the French language bills like Bill 101 are unfair? I wouldn't know where I'd answer if it's unfair or not. I have a child of Bill 101, and I lived with it comfortably. So my answer would be no. Do you believe that the language laws are unfair? Yes and no. Yes, it's unfair to, uh, I think, the French um, who cannot go to English school and have that opportunity to learn English if they have a choice. Um, also, that's also goes for immigrants who, who just immigrated to Quebec and they don't have the options of sending their, their um, kids to English school. And also, it's good because the, the grandfather clause put in for the um, parents who, are, uh, who already went to school before the um, Bill 101 uh, can go to um, English school. So, yes and no, it's very unfair to the French because I think they will benefit from learning English just as us English have benefited from learning French, so it will be very, uh, it is very unfair to them, but for, um, and the immigrants, but for uh, English, I think um, we have the, the better opportunity because we have both the English and French, which helps us in the world and on a regular scale of life to communicate in both language, and I think as I'm speaking, I think, yes, it's a bit unfair, so everybody should have the opportunity to learn, to speak, and have the opportunity to go to school in both language, and nobody should give them that, implement that law to, uh, to anybody human rights. So as I'm speaking, I'm going towards yes. <laughs> so yes, actually, I think it's uh, very unfair. Thank you. What was your reaction as well as the reactions of many other English Canadians after the implementation of Bill 101? So, so after the implementation, so I think many, well, there was over half a million English people in Quebec that first year who just left. I remember my dad coming home saying that they're opening an office in Toronto and he was asked if he wanted to go and he seriously thought about it but he grew up uh, and lived uh, roughly where we lived and uh, 
my dad did speak French, and I don't think he, he was, I don't think my dad ever thought of it as social, that they would ever go towards separation, and I don't think he thought that they would ever win the separation. It was kind of naive that way. So we, we stayed. Um, I personally would have wanted to go, uh, because it, it wasn't a good time. Although the bill makes sense on paper, since we as Quebecers ultimately live in a French society within Canada, the problem that truly stems from the bill is its inadequate English teaching with many of these French schools. This includes giving high grades for students in English as a second language programs, even though they might not be deserving because of their poor communication skills. This also includes a lack of focus on other parts of Canada and Canadian identity. Ultimately, English Quebecers are supposed to assimilate into Quebec, but French Canadians are not supposed to assimilate into Canada. Ultimately, Bill 101 hurts French Canadians more than anything. It keeps many of the youth ignorant to English, which means they can't truly perform as good as the English kids who've gotten adequate French education in elementary school when it comes to the place of business. One aspect is that it seems that the Quebec government wants French Canadians to stay within the province because that's all they could do if they only know their one language. Now, under René Lévesque in 1980, it was the first Quebec independence referendum in which almost 60% of the province said no, which is a lot larger margin than the 1995 referendum in which only 50.59% of the population voted against. I want to take this back to the FLQ. During the Quiet Revolution, a period that we have seen to be marked as serious change to Quebec and French-Canadian positioning and places of power was when English Quebecers were attacked. The difference between the Patriots and the FLQ were that the French Canadians of the early 1800s were a genuine oppressed group. In the 1960s, however, French Canadians were becoming the dominant social and economic class. In short, the FLQ were not some revolutionaries fighting against the Anglo-Saxon capitalism that they thought they were, since French Canadians were now the bourgeoisie business class. The only true explanation behind their doings were genuine racism and language discrimination against the English minority for historical reasonings. The attacks they had done, like the Montreal Stock Exchange bombing in 1969, the October Crisis in 1970, and their other 150 plus violent attacks against the English, truly make me wonder how it seemingly vanished as being an important geopolitical crisis of the 20th century, as well as the entire history of French Canada not being mentioned in that topic. People like my mother or stepfather didn't even know what the October Crisis was. How much do you know about the October Crisis, and how much was it talked about in school? See, that's why it would be great for you to tell me about it, because I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> how much do you know about the October Crisis? I will say I know nothing about the October Crisis, so um, I, can't, um, I can't say anything about it, so it will be nothing. <laughs> This mostly deals with the lack of recognition and remembrance for the topic. I believe similarly to how the sexist murders of women during the École Polytechnique massacre in Quebec has become a day of remembrance and action against violence against women, that the month of October should be a remembrance of violence against English Quebecers and the discrimination we still feel today due to the language bills that had so negatively affected people just like my father. Fundamentally, if we are either French Canadian Catholics, English Quebecois Protestants, Arab Quebecois Muslims, or anything in between, we are all Quebecers and Canadians, even if at times you do not feel like it. It seems to me that the waves of French Canadian separatism and the movement that started it all back in the 1960s has tarnished many of the relationships between English Quebecers and the Quebec government. I think the path forward is leniency on our language laws, the recognition, remembrance, and full history of the FLQ to be taught to our youth, because the purpose of us looking back on our history is to reflect on our mistakes. But if we don't even know that those mistakes existed, we can never move forward. That we, English, don't want to uh, take away their language, but we also want to learn their language, but they also have to come to the same level with us and, and come to the table and say, okay, meet us halfway, basically. And both, both language should be at the same level instead of one being greater than one. And I think that will be it. If we all can just be at the same level and stop competing and just stop um, trying to say what is better. Uh, yes, there's history. Yes, there is a lot, but sometimes we have to move forward. And I think moving forward would help in big time.